sci-fi and fantasy short stories. Of Risk and Relativity by Leslie Heron. Chapter 3, An Ice Plan. Eric slammed a fist into the pile of furs around him. I need to leave. And I told you, not until you see the healers. Indiga looked up from the carrot he was chopping into the already bubbling stew pot. No arguments. Pulling at his hair, Eric felt the uneasy energy twitching inside his skull. It had taken him a few days to gather the strength to do more than sit up and lay down. Time he didn't have. So much needed to be done. Then take me to the healers already. It's been days, and I can barely hear the wind anymore. Surely we can travel. Indiga was back to his preparations. You know, instead of complaining, you could take a moment to get to know me. Like you said, it's been days. I fed you, nursed you back to health, and not once have you asked me about me. Those are the things I have already thanked you for. Eric interrupted as he rose unsteadily to his feet for the first time since he had awoken. Social niceties are a waste of time. He had to hunch in the short hut, lest his head scrape the roof of the hide structure. With a choppy step, he moved for the tied flap that led outside. I appreciate what you have done, but I am not your prisoner. Just, just give me some supplies and point me in the right direction. I'll make it on my own because I don't have time for this. Without even looking up, Indiga pointed a finger towards the half-elf. Duck! Sit. To which the massive dog obeyed, raising from his napping spot next to the potbelly stove and pounced. Poof! <coughs> Eric cried out as the full weight of the creature forced him to the ground, and the attempts to wriggle free were squashed when the hound sat atop him, squeezing the air from his lungs. Setting aside the other ingredients for the stew, Indiga scooted along the floor towards the pair. I found you. I rescued you. And where I come from, that means you are my responsibility. The baby bird with a broken wing. What kind of man would I be if I just let you go back out there to die? Eric struggled to suck in a breath from beneath the weight of the dog, only succeeding in pulling in a mouthful of shed fur. Then, <laughs> he coughed, then take me there. I promised I would help, and I am. Indiga gave Duck a hearty pat on his haunch, fighting back his smile as the dog's tail began to whip back and forth across Eric's face. You might not have any manners, but I do, and I don't let my guests get themselves killed. If I don't get back, your manners will get everyone killed. With a roll of his eyes, Indiga made a motion with his hand, and his furry friend stood, releasing the man beneath. Fine, go. He scowled and grabbed a spare coat, chucking it in his direction. We'll see how far you get. A bit taken aback, Eric lay there for a moment, shocked by the sudden shift in his host's demeanor. He quickly donned the fur jacket over his tattered Hawaiian shirt. He was already wearing borrowed pants and boots, his own being far too thin to provide warmth, even in the cozy hut. <coughs> what about supplies? Oh, I don't think you'll be needing any. The slightest hint of the jovial tone started to edge back into his voice. Eric scowled, but he could expect nothing more. He had to get back to the tower, see if he could salvage his computer, and if not find some other source of technology, all while avoiding the wrath of two mad gods. <sighs> he hoped they could be reasoned with, perhaps even manipulated into aiding him. But judging by Alpha's reaction to seeing him, he did not like his odds. Damn it, Vel, Eric grumbled as he turned to face the exit of the tent. He was just like his meddling brother to complicate matters. Of course he would show up, possessed by a mad deity without telling him, and toss a wrench into his works. Honestly, 
Surviving the frozen north would be simple compared to dealing with that headache. Again. Without another word, he reached for the tied knot that held the flap tightly closed. His fingers shook, trembling uncontrollably at the slightest exertion. His jaw tensed as he willed them to obey, but his fine motor skills were gone. He screamed and slapped the leather tangle in frustration. Well, off to a good start, eh? Indiga gave him a sidelong glance as he scooted over and undid the tie with one hand. Eric growled and pushed past him, exiting the tent and squinting as the brilliant sunlight accosted his eyes. As his vision adjusted to the blinding white, he realized why they had not left the tent. They didn't need to. The magic of the sulkies never ceased to amaze him. They were not, as he initially thought, hunkered down against a mountainside or in the sheltering protection of trees. The three of them, tent and all, were on a floating chunk of ice about a quarter acre in size. The entire thing was moving against the wind fast enough that he could feel the rush of air at their passing. And through it all, the ride was so smooth they could have been stationary. Eric's lips twitched momentarily into a grin as he spotted a pod of dolphins slip in and out of view in the wake of their chunk of ice, giving him a playful display. But the euphoria of sulky magic could only hold his attention for so long, and he found himself once again spiraling down into the dangerous what-ifs. He felt a shiver run through him and pulled his borrowed coat tighter over his shoulders, only the open expanse of glassy water surrounded them, even as he squinted against the sunlight. He was far, so very far from where he needed to be. What's this? You're still here? Eric looked over at the sarcastic comment, expecting to see the man standing beside him, but instead only saw empty space. He scanned around several times before he looked down to see the silky crouched on his knees. He lifted a brow. What? He started, giving the man a scrupulous look. What are you doing down there? Indiga shook his head, keeping his eyes trained on the darkening shadow on the horizon. You mean, aside from spending the last week floating your ungrateful behind upwind... I'm wondering if you're this rude to everyone or just completely oblivious. Faltering, Eric took a step back. He opened his mouth to explain, but as he did, he could see the man fully for the first time. You're a cripple. The bottom half of one of his pant legs was deflated, empty, and the other held a severely atrophied leg that couldn't possibly support the weight of a fully grown man. Indiga raised an eyebrow. Both, apparently. I just, uh, I hadn't noticed. I... Eric shook his head. He had been so preoccupied with his own thoughts that, despite being with the man for over a week, he hadn't realized why he had never once stood. What happened? Indiga bore his gaze into the half-elf for several seconds before he returned his sights to the ocean. Eh, I lost them to a twenty-foot shark. He shrugged a little as Duck came out of the tent to join him. He latched one hand into the dog's oversized collar and hoisted himself off the ground. Once he was fully supported by the animal, he reached down, one hand still holding on, to pull up the pant leg of his atrophied leg. I was young, and it was my fault. Just an unlucky exploratory bite. I mean, I was in her hunting grounds. She just did what was natural. Well, I guess sharks do like seals. Before he could stop himself, the doctor in him took over, and Eric leaned in to inspect the limb. He scratched at the thick beard that had replaced his scruff as he took in the sight of the heavily mauled leg. The shark had taken out most, if not all, of the sulky man's calf muscle. Thick bands of scar tissue were pulled tight against the bone and skin, leaving a severely mangled leg in its place. 
He felt a wave of regret for how he had treated the man. You know, I could fix this for you. A frown tugged at Indiga's expression as he chewed on his words for a moment. Fix what? I'm guessing your people are so remote they don't know much about prosthetics. Eric stroked at his chin and then stood, clutching the furs tighter around his shoulders. Your left leg would be an easy fix. He gestured towards the empty pant leg. A simple limb constructed out of wood with a hinged joint, and depending on how much use you have remaining in the other leg, crutches or maybe some form of walker could help you get back to normal. A light smile creased the corners of his mouth. I could easily craft both for you, given access to some tools. They wouldn't be pretty, but with some work you might be able to walk again. That was my field in college. His smile darkened. Well, my second field. You know that doesn't count as an actual apology, right? Indiga's face hardened as he clambered up Duck's back. Offering some service to make yourself feel better rather than actually meaning it doesn't excuse your callous behavior. Eric felt his face redden. I'm just trying to repay you for helping me. You want to pay me back? Come back inside, have some stew, and get to know me. He clicked his tongue against his teeth as he nudged the dog back towards the tent. And for the record, there's nothing wrong with me. I am who I am because of the choices I made. There's nothing to fix. Eric opened his mouth to respond, but sighed instead as he watched the pair disappear inside. He looked back into the water rushing past, filled with tiny chunks of ice that magically moved out of their way. Then he glanced down at his blackened fingers. The choices he had made. That was all well and good for the Selkie, but Eric didn't have the luxury of making choices. He played the hand he had been dealt, and it was nothing but a pair of twos. There had to be a way to expedite his return to the tower. Perhaps, when they made landfall, he could dust off that old ace up his sleeve and present himself once more as the king. For the fifth time since they had begun their trip back to town, Atlas looked over his shoulder to see nothing but empty space. Ah, oh, stop! He wrapped his knuckles on the back of the robot that he was currently clinging to. His new companion was, once again, missing. He sighed. We lost him again. As the robot slowed, spinning them both around, Atlas cupped a hand around his mouth and shouted, Oi! New guy! What's the holdup? There was a moment of silence, then rushing footsteps and a distant apology. Sorry! As the dryad bounced back into view, holding that small wooden box, Atlas leveled a finger at him. You stopped to talk to the plants again, didn't you? <sighs> I couldn't help it. He began tucking a yellow disposable camera back into one of the side pockets of his bag, one of several he had brought along for his tour of the world's forests. There was a beautiful tripod ivy just sitting there, and I had to introduce my dad. He always wanted to see one in the wild. He carefully wedged the wooden box back into his pack as well while he ran. Turns out she was just as excited to meet me. A dryad. <laughs> Small world, eh? The grin on his face masked the sinking feeling that this was just him having a mental breakdown. He knew other worlds existed. Everyone did. But talking to plants? Self-aware robots? It was all a little too... crazy. Okay, so that was a poor choice of words, but he had no other way to describe what was happening to him. Atlas closed his eye with a grumbled sigh. If you stop for one more panty-shy shrub or a humpbacked thistleweed or a flowering forage sucker, so help me, by the realm of desire, I will bury you beneath whatever wonky name plant you find next. Lucas casually shrugged and opened his mouth to apologize once more, 
when a warm, glowing light flooded through the forest, illuminating their path. Atlas dropped from the robot, staring around at all the beams of light shooting from between the remaining trees, and then back over at his dryad companion, their expressions easily readable in the light. What in the hills is this, then? Uh, spotlights? Lucas pulled a face as he looked around. Maybe they just turned them all on at once? There had been plenty of light fixtures that could have been responsible for the glow, but he didn't stop to examine them as they darted around the city. He spotted something dark and angular on the trail of footprints, and Lucas leaned over, plucking it up off the ground. It was one of those personality protocols that had escaped from the hole in the box. Looks like we're on the right path. He turned this one over as he straightened up reading math quiz on it before showing the little gray brick to his new friend. Uh, let's keep moving. Atlas sniffed as he returned his attention to the glittering light filtering in around them. I don't like the looks of this. Lucas tucked the cartridge into his bag, cramming it in with a small handful of others and fell in line behind the hobbling man. They continued on in silence, moving cautiously as they followed the trail of tread marks left previously by their robotic companion. Every so often, he would stoop down and pick up another dropped cartridge off the ground, inspecting them in the light of the glow from the city, each one just as ridiculous as the last. ASMR! Lucas frowned at the label of this one as he glanced over his shoulder at the machine. Who needs an ASMR robot? What does that even imply? Unit 2 pantomimed someone falling asleep. Oh, I get it. Lucas pulled a face as he tucked the cartridge into his bag with the others. It doesn't make sense, he muttered to himself, returning his eyes to the path. But I get it. He had just found another one, stopping to pick it up off the ground when a hand tapped at him furiously. Lucas was struggling to read the smudged label on this cartridge as he stood. I can't read this one. Politician? Nah. Pugilist? Hey, what do you think this one... says? His voice trailed off as he looked up, catching sight of the reason Atlas was tapping his shoulder. Blocking their path into the city was a literal wall of light with bolts of electricity occasionally pulsing across its surface. The three of them carefully made their way the remaining distance through the trees and past a few outlying houses until they stood before it. It was semi-transparent, allowing them a hazy view of the street on the other side. Their eyes followed the wall of light upward to see it had created a dome that covered, as far as they could tell, the entire metropolis. With a shaky laugh, Lucas pushed the latest personality protocol cartridge into his bag before removing the disposable camera once more. <laughs> I guess that's what they meant by sealing off the city. He snapped a quick picture, absently winding the dial. He scratched at his eyebrow nervously as he turned back to look at the arcanist. So, uh, what now? Atlas, leaning carefully against his crutches, extended a hand until his finger pressed against the wall of light. He was hoping it would pass through harmlessly, but wasn't at all surprised when instead he nearly collapsed in pain as electricity flowed through him. He wrenched his finger away, staring down at the sizzling digit before he threw his hands up in frustration. Ugh, why can't anything ever be easy? Realizing the man was just venting and probably not looking for an actual answer, Lucas kept his response to himself as he stepped forward. He gingerly pushed a finger against the wall of light and felt the same electrifying pain tear through him. Ah, ah, maybe we could dig underneath it? Or construct some sort of, uh, I don't know, anti-light shield techno thingy? Dig underneath it? Atlas's face twisted in disbelief for several seconds before he shook his head with a roll of his eye and pointed at the robot. Oi, you! See if you can make it through that. No? <laughs> Trust me, robots and electricity don't mix. I've seen enough movies to know that much. Unit 2 nodded in agreement. 
I don't know what a movie is, but that sounds dumb. Alice poked at the wall again. What we need is a way across without actually crossing it. He moved his sizzling fingers to his chin, mentally working through his options. He did not like where this was going. We need to teleport across. It's tricky, kind of a reverse banishment, but I know how to make a gateway. What, like a portal? No, not a portal. Those things are dangerous. He waved a hand around. You can see the damage caused by the last person who tried messing with those. What we need is a planar hop. And it's different. Of course it's different. Just a quick dip out of reality and back in. No crossing any multidimensional borders. Easiest thing in the world. I just have to remember how. Lucas rolled his eyes. Yeah, totally not a portal. And you said my idea was dumb. After being shushed by the arcanist, he watched as the man began to draw glowing sigils in the air. They hung there, weightless and illuminated, as more and more symbols were crafted alongside them. His jaw slowly dropped. Magic! It was always something of a rumor where Lucas was from. It was the superstitious scapegoat for odd things happening, disappearing travelers or unusual creature sightings. There was never any real proof of such a thing existing. But as he stood there, watching seven glowing symbols hover in the air before him, a light chuckle bubbled up. What? He couldn't stop himself and lifted a finger, reaching out to touch one of the glittering lights. Atlas reached over and slapped the curious hand away. Do you have any idea what would happen if you touched that? Lucas rubbed his hand sheepishly. Nah. Well, neither do I. So unless you want to be transfigured into a teacup instead of teleporting into the city, don't touch. He scratched at his eye patch as he struggled to remember the next sequence of sigils. Just go stand guard. We have eight more sets of these to do, I think. Despite the twinge of fear at the idea of trusting magic to teleport them across an impenetrable wall of lightning, Lucas couldn't help but stare wide-eyed at the arcanist. Eventually, the admonishing gaze from Atlas convinced him to seek entertainment elsewhere, and he turned back towards the path into the city. After mulling about for a minute, his eyes caught something just on the other side of the glowing wall. Another little gray brick. And then a figure stepped into focus right at the edge of the barrier and bent down, picking it up. Lucas took a hasty step back. The battle doll skirt ruffled around the woman's armored boots with each step as Ruby turned to face him. Her blonde curls bounced around her face as she stopped to stare at the dark-skinned man, then turned her gaze to the arcanist. She sucked in a deep breath through her nose, and a smile pulled at the corners of her lips. Hey, mate, your crazy ex is here. <sighs> Trying to concentrate here. Atlas erased his latest rune, replacing it with what he hoped was the correct one. The jewel locked eyes with Lucas, and her smile widened, exposing her pearly white teeth to him as her manservant came tottering up behind her. She held up the gray brick, and then another. He groaned. She had tracked them down using the voice modules like breadcrumbs. That female soldier must have reported on them, giving the battle doll a direction to follow. Uh, busy or not, we have company. Atlas glanced up and cursed. Now was not the time. It's fine. Look, if we can't get in, she can't get out. He began moving the sigils around in his spell, lining the nine layers up like puzzle pieces. I'll just simply readjust our destination point to be further in the city. Lucas relaxed a bit at that. He felt a sense of false bravado come over him, and he swaggered up to the light. Hear that? 
You can't touch me. Ruby's hand shot through the glowing wall and latched her armored fingers around his collar before hauling the dryad backwards and pulling him tight against the electrified barrier. She laughed a broken, ragged sound as he spasmed in pain. Atlas glanced up, sweat pouring down his face from his efforts. Oh, my bad. He glanced back at his runic equation, nearly complete. Just, uh, hold her off for a second. Nearly done. <laughs> Unit 2 zoomed forward, grabbing Lucas around the waist before throwing himself in reverse. Ruby struggled to hold the dryad against the barrier until her power armor began to complain, and she let go. A silent laughter shook her shoulders as the pair shot backwards with the speed of a rock loosed from a slingshot, toppling over one another. Following the jewel as she stepped through the barrier, Charles glanced around at the scattered bodies before he threw out an accusatory finger at the dark-skinned man. You! You're the doctor that ruined my face! Lucas chuckled nervously as he climbed to his feet. <laughs> I think it was ruined long before I got to it, mate. He sighed as he looked down at the singed state of his clothes. How about we call it even? Her manservant took an angry step forward, ready to unleash his wrath upon the others, but Ruby simply backhanded him out of the way as she reached for the dryad, fingers latching around his throat. As she began to squeeze, gently at first, a green light erupted around the field of her vision, fighting the yellow luminescence of the shield. Oi! Crazy! Spinning on her heel... Ruby saw the arcanist standing next to a swirling green gateway. A smile just curled her features as he finished scrawling a rune into the air and with a rude gesture sent a fireball hurtling in her direction. She dropped the dryad, lifting her forearm to block the spell, and the projectile fizzled on contact. Atlas swore and began hobbling away. Bloody brotherhood and their bloody anti-magic warding! That's cheating! From the ground, Lucas coughed and hacked around the sudden rush of air lost from his lungs. He wheezed as he pushed himself up, calling out, oh, I thought... <coughs> he said it wasn't a portal. It's not a portal! As she closed in on the arcanist, Ruby grabbed him by the back of his medical gown and hauled him off his crutches. She turned him around to face her, opening her mouth to hiss at him when something collided against her back. A thin, dark-skinned arm wrapped around her neck, and she nearly laughed as the dryad ineffectively attempted to put her in a headlock. It had been a long time since his last visit to the gym, Lucas realized as the jewel made no notice of his attempts to put her to sleep. He switched tactics and, grimacing at the thought of cheating, he grabbed a fistful of those blonde locks and yanked hard. Ruby screamed in pain and surprise, dropping the arcanist as she spun in place, her hands scrabbling to get hold of the man clinging to her back. That broken sound of agony sent a jolt of terror through Lucas, causing his grip to tighten even as she spun in circles. He looked over her shoulder to see his friend, however, was scribbling in the dirt. What are you doing? Get up and help me! Atlas shot upright and lunged, his giant cast making his heroic motions look clumsy and accidental. But he managed to claw one hand under Ruby, spinning her towards him as the other hand shot out past her face to cover the dryad's eyes. Right on cue... A glowing orb raised into the air between them. His signature move. He locked on to those emerald eyes and said through a smile, Lady, take the hint. I'm not interested. He clamped his own eyes shut just as the blinding light erupted, dimming the light from the golden barrier. Ruby collapsed, screaming in her broken way as she clawed at her face. Atlas hauled Lucas off the ground. We need to go, now. Blinking between the pops of color in his vision, Lucas glanced around. Where's the robot? He spotted the machine nearby, 
standing stock still and pointing up at something just beyond the barrier. Another new source of illumination. A glowing blue orb of lightning had begun to expand, threatening to engulf the entire city, them included. He took a hasty step back. Uh, what is that? Nothing good, I'd wager. Atlas's mouth turned down as he shook his head. Time to go. He spun, hobbling towards the portal, holding onto the robot for support. Lucas hesitated for a breath. He swallowed his fear and bent down, plucking up the man's crutches and jogging after them. He then spotted the voice module that Crazy Woman had dropped and snatched it up too. Hurry! Atlas hopped onto the robot's back and twisted, holding out his hand. It's best to maintain contact or it can close on you. The blue ball of lightning was nearly on top of them now, but Lucas couldn't help but stare at that hand. Well, he had always wanted an adventure, and wasn't that what he had set out to do in the first place? He hefted his bag higher on his back. <sighs> Come on, Dad. He reached out, latching on to that pale hand, and as the three of them stepped into the swirling green of the definitely not-a-portal portal... portal he felt oddly better, less alone. A moment later, Charles blinked and opened his eyes, struggling to see clearly through the haze of tears. Blue lightning had reached the area, swirling around him and kicking up wind. Debris and dust flew through the air as bolts of electricity tore the green gateway asunder like tissue paper in a hurricane. It rolled over him leaving the hairs on his body standing on end, but doing no harm beyond that. As the wind evaporated, leaves and papers fluttering slowly around him, he saw that he was all alone. Talking to people was never a strong suit of Eric's. Sure, he could fake it when the need arose, but with such weighty tasks on his mind... Such pleasantries felt like a guilty waste of precious time and willpower, even if there was nothing he could do at the moment but wait. Luckily, his host did not suffer the same affliction. As soon as Eric made the effort to open up to the man, information spilled forth with the energy of a broken dam. It was almost as if his rude transgression had never happened, and the Selkie was happy and bubbly as the first time they met. Even though the pair had nothing in common, one a doctor and the other a fishmonger, Indiga had mastered the art of conversation. Eric never felt awkward, talked down to, or over, and the topics always felt inclusive to encourage his participation. Even Duck was eager to join in with the occasional whine or grunt, and the food, while simple, was satisfying. Eric had even gleaned a bit of useful information. The island, or Isle of Six Kings, was a narrow, oceanic continent consisting of a half-dozen smaller countries. Each area was independently ruled by their own government, but all of them belonged to a union of free trade and travel. He learned that Indiga had come from a long line of pathfinder fishermen— men and women that journeyed out into the broken sea ice during the summer to chart paths and record migration patterns. The information gathered would become useful when the ice hardened once more. Each year the surrounding terrain changed, and unwary traders or fishermen could get lost in the maze of icebergs or ocean squalls. They were currently headed for the Selkie Nation at the southernmost end of the frozen mass. Indiga claimed they had excellent healers, but... Eric's eyes drifted to the man's leg each time he spoke of them. His confidence in their ability was less than optimistic. But, despite the history lessons and professional show-and-tell, Eric couldn't keep his mind on the moment. What he really needed was to find someone in power. There had to be a way to get south during the summer, especially if he could convince them he was the king of Ebra. He needed access to his computer, or enough technomantic relics to build a new one. This far north from the mainland, though, he wasn't going to find anything like that. 
Elias had always spoken of the northern nations as savages, and the Selkie's tales of ice fishing, orca baiting, and dog sled racing confirmed it. It was on the second day that they were interrupted by the sound of a long, bellowing horn in the distance. Eric reached for the set of clothes Indiga had lent him and slipped them on over his shoulders. Unable to work the fasteners, he simply gathered them around his hands and hugged himself as he stepped out from the tent. He was relieved to see the looming shadow of the island finally unveiled. They were approaching a massive ice shelf, and several fishermen were skirting near the edges, picking away the fishing holes to keep them open, or casting large rope lines filled with hooks into the wider sea. Several of them waved as their floating ice chunk approached, and Indigo returned it with a pearly white grin. Hey, uh, listen. Eric sighed as his shoulder slumped. I'm sorry. You were right. I shouldn't have implied that there was anything wrong with you by offering to fix your legs. Indiga turned, acknowledging the man with a stiff nod. Well, I'm glad you finally come to your senses. I'm just a little sorry it took two and a half days. He shuffled over to the edge of the iceberg and reached into the water below, fetching out a length of rope. The hooks were bare of any fish, but he hadn't really expected there to be anything on them at the speeds they had been traveling. Yeah, I'm not good at this sort of thing. Eric scratched at the itchy mustache that had grown beneath his nose before returning his hand to the fur lining inside the sleeve of his borrowed coat. I'm a scientist. I think in numbers, not emotions. So I don't have much experience navigating social situations. <laughs> Just do me a favor and try to be polite when you meet my family. Indiga coiled up the fishing line and shuffled into a sitting position. Welcome to Oakery. As they rounded the edge of the ice shelf, a snow-dotted community with tiny, simple homes painted in many vibrant colors came into view. Thirty or forty wooden domiciles encircled a large building at the city center, and tiny paths led up into the icy, rolling hills beyond. He could see movement as traders, seafarers, and fishermen approached the ocean's edge to start their day. Horned animals, similar to caribou but larger, were being ushered along by their bundled-up herders, dragging along carts piled high with textiles. Whales dipped in and out of sight, leaving only bursts of rainbows behind as they came up for air. But the one thing that was in abundance, besides the selkies, were dogs. Ginormous huskies in all shapes and colors were playing in the snow, lounging in the sun, or being hitched to sleds in line with others. There were no ships, no wooden vessels or carved canoes. There were only floating chunks of ice being guided along by sulky magic. Some sheets were so large that a crew stood aboard working in tandem to keep the monstrosity moving, where others were just large enough to fit a single person in their fishing rod. Sure, he couldn't see any boats, but they had to exist. One of the Selkie's main sources of income was trade with the northern reaches of Ebra and Athia. He just needed to find a trader willing to brave the journey this time of year. As plain and hardy as this community was, Eric couldn't fight the smile creeping across his lips. So this is where you were born? It's nice. He looked down. Quaint. Indiga laughed as he reached inside his robes and pulled out a rectangular black box with a long antenna shooting out from the top of it. I think you'll find it to be a bit more impressive once we've landed. Gripping the edges of the handheld device, he pushed it close to his mouth and said, Receiver, this is fishing vessel Flounder, returning to Dock 37. Eric slowly turned his head back to the crippled sulky his jaw dropping as he heard a response crackle over the black box. Welcome back, Flounder. We have you clear for approach. Catch anything good? Indiga barked a laugh. Oh, I got a big one. Would you mind prepping a vehicle for transport to the healers? Everything all right? 
Eric had a million questions. But before he could stop himself, he crouched down beside the man, staring in awe at the item he held. It was a two-way radio. Not something rudimentary or cobbled together, but an off-the-shelf, brand-new walkie-talkie. Indiga gave the half-elf a quizzical look and shook his head. Uh, everything's fine. Uh, just a slight case of frostbite. Over and out. <sighs> How? Wh what? Eric's brain flatlined as he struggled with what he was seeing. Oh, this? The sulky waved the black box around. It's just a communications device. Nothing to be terrified of. I know that. Eric reached for it, plucking it from the other man's hands and turning it over in his own. Even though the design was a bit outdated, it had an anodized black metal housing with rubber for knobs and its antenna. How do you have this? Why does it work? Indiga blinked several times, and as their ice chunk slid quietly into an empty space at the wooden dock... He pointed to a large metal spire in the center of town, visible all the way from the shore. Well, honestly, I don't know how it works. I'm not an engineer. But all the traders have them. It keeps us safe during the summer storms. He smiled. Oh, look! <laughs> Our right is here! Eric could hardly pull his attention away from the walkie-talkie. But when he did, he nearly dropped the thing into the water. A simple two-seater truck was creeping through the fishmongers and dogs, pulling to a stop just past the wooden planks of the dock. He could even hear the low whine of an electric motor as it was shifted into park. Wh wh huh? Climbing onto the back of Duck, Indiga motioned for Eric to follow as the dog stepped off the ice chunk and onto the dock. He tapped the hood of the vehicle. This here is called a truck, and it's what's going to take us into town. You've been listening to Of Risk and Relativity by Leslie Heron, book five in the series here on Tall Tale TV. If you would like to listen to the entire book in one place, or any of her other novels, you can find them at talltaletv.com slash series, or by following the links in the description. Sir, you're really friends with a bear. How did that happen? Oh, well, uh, we went to school together. We met in the lunchroom one day and... Hey, stop! Not another step! Huh? What's going on? You know I'm on crutches, right? Oh, my God. Oh, no. Is it a bear trap? Oh, I hate those things. Somebody help me. It's a Cosmos Astro Sanguinius. A what? Are they dangerous? These things are supposed to be extinct in the wild. Look at that coloring. Another bloody plant. You stopped us for a... What did I tell you was going to happen? You don't understand. These things just don't appear... It doesn't matter. Let's go. Wait, but... Uh, the plant... Wait for me. Just one pick. I will leave you behind. Coming!